Today with um, Dylan Nomenio, who's going to be talking about his new song cycle, Woodluck, which is uh, a, a series of eight songs uh, based on the poems of Robert Burns. So, greetings. Now, let's hear a little bit about you. So, as a composer, what have you been doing? Where what's your focus on? Uh, so, until I guess until recently, I've thought of myself more as a multimedia composer. Um, I started, I mean, I studied at, at Box Hill in a, a film music degree. Um, and since then I've done, I've done quite a few films. Um, I'm working on a video game at the moment. Um, I've done sound art and more avant-garde music concrete, um, technology-based music more than anything. Um, but in my second year of studying at Box Hill, I joined the Box Hill Chorale. And since then I've been in love with uh, with choral music and with uh, vocal music in general, and I definitely consider myself now. I mean, I guess after my um, my initiation, uh, this being my first um, concert of my own works, um, I consider myself a lot more a classical composer um, in in preferred style. Yeah. So um, it was the chorale, the Box Hill Chorale, that gave you that impetus to move beyond dare I say, studio-based work to... It, it was once I realised that the scale of it was, um, was manageable within, you know, the reality of Australia. I mean, I'd always adored the, the works of uh, Vaughan Williams and, um, and Holst and, and Verdi, but it, it's not exactly uh, something that uh, many Australian composers can actually aspire to writing, you know, full orchestral suites. Um, so, with, I mean, it, that was what gave me the impetus to sort of start writing really solidly for, for smaller ensembles um, and especially writing for the voice. Um, and I'd always had a, a strong sense of the English language um, and a strong connection to it. Um, so in that sense, this sort of was, it was the perfect fit, really. So uh, what did you, was, when you moved um, into looking at acoustic music, dare I say that word, um, did you look at it from the point of view of doing chain because you thought that was where you most most likely will get performances rather than trying to write full full breadth works, you know, for orchestra? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, the scale is um, is much easier to work with as well. I mean, everyone starts writing chamber ensembles. No one starts with an orchestral uh, suite, but it's also um, it's much more it's much more intimate. And you have a chance um, with Robert Burns, for example, to talk about much more, or rather to sing about, to, to set text, which is much more intimate in nature. Uh, and a lot of which has never been set, and never, never been performed um, in anything more than, you know, a single line or a single verse, you know, melody with chord accompaniment, folk accompaniment, effectively. So that was the main reason. Um, but of course, play being played comes into it as well because at the end of the day the music that you're writing is a, a part of yourself that you want to share um, all composers music is a part of themselves but it's hard to share it when there's no one who will be able to hear it um, and with voice especially um, your your midi and your digital technologies don't encompass that yet um, and that maybe never will um, whereas with full orchestral works, you can you can write an orchestral work, upload the score to YouTube, and people say it's fantastic and it's all played with Hollywood level um, synthesized uh, instruments. Uh, but the voice is something you can't do that with. So that was another thing that makes it makes vocal music more unique. Yeah. You mentioned uh, a number of um, grand masters of the of the classical music like Vaughan Williams um, and I think it was Holst you mentioned. Um, so is English, the 20th century English, is that your milieu, mm -hmm. that you, the area you like in the classical area? It, it, definitely moving more towards that the more I, uh, the more I become familiar with it. Uh, there's, a, there's a definite aversion for me away from the, um, the Teutonic canon 
um, of you know Baroque and early classical um, German composers, um, especially and, and German Austrian composers. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure why that is, but I immediately identified with Vaughan Williams upon first hearing, um, and some of my some of my first experiences with his his work his vocal works was with the Box Hill Chorale, um, for which I have to thank uh, Andrew Wales, who also 20th century English music seems to be his milieu as well, um, at least chorally speaking. Um, so that that is where my interest lies, um, and a lot of the um, the string music from that era as well, um, especially coming out of England and Wales um, and Scotland as well, um, those areas are definitely a focus for me, yeah. You mentioned uh, the area of, um, in one of the areas of interest is the, the folk area um, that Vaughan Williams has done and others have set in, in choral music. Is that how you sort of move back into looking at um, Robert Burns because a lot of what he's been setting has got that folk element to it, whether the text necessarily warrants it or not, people have used that as the, the way forward because of, of, of the nature of the poet. Um, is that how you gravitated toward Robert Burns or was it you already had an interest in Robert Burns? So I'd always heard of Robert Burns through... Um, I mean, just, just in terms of, you know, he's, he's famous for his, his poetry, especially his nationalistic poetry. Um, but when I looked more into it, purely out of interest for the poetry itself, not musical interest, um, I discovered that there was a lot more there which had never really been, you know, never really been seen as uh, that was Robert Burns' thing. Um, where it was always, you know, Old Lang Syne and Scott Swahey and mm. all those kinds of uh, works. I, I think um, the folk element definitely plays into it in that folk, folk lyrics are quite often timeless and um, I enjoy poetry that is timeless and I, um, given that I work in, I guess, an archaic medium, um, it's, it's useful for my music to have lyrics which are timeless as well and um, I would like to think that music, you know, we, we still listen to music from 300 years ago and much of it is still relevant um, and I'd like to think that my works will be as relevant as, and timeless as Burns' poetry or that I've done justice to it in that sense in 50 years, 100 years as well. So the folk element of, um, of the lyrics I think is more important than the, the musical legacy um, but I also do have a connection to folk music through um, Growing up, you know, the basically all the music I heard was of Bob Dylan, Donovan, Joan Baez. So um, that's really fallen back into you know chords and chords and a melody over the top, um, which is is echoed in this work as well. There's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot more complex harmonic work in there, but fundamentally. Uh, it's always it's always coming back to the singer, you know, being accompanied by an instrument and telling telling a, a, a story through timeless lyrics. So how did you, um, because there's a, a great body of work, I mean, he didn't write only a small amount of, of, of poetry here, he wrote a lot. So how did you scale it down to just those eight works? Uh, that was the most difficult part, for sure. Um, it was difficult finding poems which were of the right length. Um, because a lot of Burns' poetry is um, reels upon reels of drinking songs, for example, which might have 40 verses, and they're all composed in different years. Um, so I, I basically just went through as much of it as I could find, usually on the internet, um, various um, translations as well. So um, there were lots of English translations. Obviously, he wrote in Scottish English as well, um, but there are there are areas where it was it was much easier to find popular poems which were two or three stanzas in length which is optimal for art song um, and yeah that was the main thing really I looked for evocative poems with very very powerful words attached to them very powerful sentiments uh, ones which hadn't been set before or had a, a preconceived melody that people might have latched onto or that I might have latched onto as a composer so that was, that was by far the most difficult thing about the work, was selecting the text and setting the text appropriately.
Okay, so if we can narrow it down from eight to two. Um, I'll meet thee at the uh, Lee Rig. I think that's Lee Rig. Lee Rig or Lee, 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 Lee Rig. It. I asked a few Scottish people about it, and they all came down on different sides. All right, so, uh, so we'll, we'll we'll leave it at that. I'll meet thee at the Lear Rig, and uh, Wounded Hair seemed to have resonated with the audience at the at the concert. Yeah. Um, let's a little discussion about these two works briefly before we listen to them. Sure. So I'll meet thee on the Lear Rig was the last work that I uh, that I composed, and it's definitely the one that comes most from the from the folk canon. It's it's all through composed. There are all the pieces are through composed, um, but it's definitely got a, a definitive section, and then the whole section repeats, and then it repeats one last time. Um, so it's just three A sections effectively, um, and it's also probably the most um, the most relaxed and sort of joyful of all the pieces. Um, the other, a lot of the others deal with very heavy, um, very heavy content whereas I'll meet the other Lear rig is really just about life in rural Scotland as a as a young Burns with a young love um, and that's the the beautiful human side of that of that uh, that side of Burns's poetry um, when you come to the wounded hare you're looking at a much older Burns um, at least in outlook um, and you're looking at him seeing horrible things done to the nature of um, that or the, the expression of nature that he finds his own comfort in throughout his entire life, um, and it you know the poem starts with um, inhuman man curse on thy barbarous art, um, and it's it's all about you know this person who has seen a hare and then shot it or hit it with something, it's been wounded and then he's describing all the feelings that are encapsulated in that moment where the hare's running away and he knows that eventually this hare will will die and there's just no hope for anyone and, and doom and gloom and all humanity deserves to um, be damaged for what has happened here and that's um, that's another very beautiful evocative um, text from Burns that takes a totally different turn um, and it's it's the longest song it's the most harmonically complex song. It's got that wonderful low E flat, which everyone seemed to enjoy in the concert uh, from from James Emerson, and um, yeah, it's it's definitely the most uh, conceptually whole work, I think. Well, I think um, we're going to hear the two works. Uh, one that's on the lighter side, one that's going to be on the more darker or heavier side. So it, it shows you up as the composer trying to do the, mm. the light and shade in, in, in musical terms. Yes, so we will hear the two songs. Um, I'll meet you, I'll meet, meet the On the Lyric and The Wounded Hair. The performance of James Emerson and Dean Sky Lucas. Um, and we'll hear that now. So thank you, um, Dylan, very much for your time today. Thank you so much. Enjoy. Oh, 
nights were near so wild, and I were near so weary, oh, I'll meet me on the lee, my own kind dearie,
and curse our Rabbians. Earth. 